Hello and welcome to the February episode of Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack. Now, one of the most popular episodes last year was with Rob Ford discussing Brexit Land, the book he's co-written, which takes a look at the long term social and demographic changes driving British politics. So I'm delighted this time to welcome to the show his co-author, Professor Maria Sobolewska. Welcome to the show, Maria. Thank you so much for inviting me. Very exciting. Now, let's start with a re- quick recap of the book for anyone who didn't hear the earlier show or who has heard it, but their memory has faded a little bit. Can you explain the three sort of groups the book breaks the country into and uses to explain changes in British politics? So the book uh, covers two kind of sorts of big long term changes in post-war Britain. And the first one is sociological change. So the kind of society in which we live that has changed. And the second part focuses uh, much more about the politics and the political changes. And the three groups you already mentioned are basically the new kind of ideal types of British voters that have emerged as a result of those uh, sociological changes. The two big changes we discuss in the book particularly are the increase in the number of people who go to university and uh, the number of people who uh, can trace their origin to non-white British origins. And so what we have is two liberal groups, and uh, the liberal group is then subdivided uh, further. So the first first, uh, group, and this is the one that gets always almost all the coverage, uh, and this is um, a group of what we call identity conservatives. We call them that because we are slightly uh, wary about using the slightly more popular name for them, which is, of course, the left behind, which most people would have been familiar with already. The left behind gets um, complicated and overused, and a lot of people use it to indicate uh, poverty and a kind of um, economic uh, deprivation. So we are trying to roll back on this and think, no, this group differs not because of the economic position. This group is special because of their position towards um, their position towards liberalism more broadly. So this is the group that is considerably less liberal uh, than our elites, political elites, our commentariat, and quite a few uh, younger voters and some of those voters who live in cities and are uh, creating that impression of Um, cosmopolitan, urban, avocado-eating voters that that they are opposed to. So these voters... I mean, had an avocado for lunch today. I'm feeling very stereotyped. (laughs) So um, those voters who we call identity conservatives would probably disapprove of your avocado breakfast choice. And the reason why they are special is that they used to be the vast majority of our population. So the British population used to be predominantly white, and predominantly not university educated. So these people are basically the same kinds of people that we have had, they used to dominate our electorate, but they have been faced with a very uh, swift shrinking and they are aware of this shrinking. So this makes them feel threatened. This makes them feel like the rest of the, the society has abandoned them, moved on and changed their priorities. Uh, Of course, uh, the Labour Party is a great example here because these people would have um, been the main voter that the Labour Party would want to speak to and win their votes, Um, whereas now they would have uh, felt that because they are shrinking, the Labour Party has moved on and wants to talk about race and ethnic minorities and not about them anymore and their lives. Uh, So these are your identity conservatives. Um, And these are the kinds of people who we saw mobilized against that social change a lot in the run up to the referendum. They were against immigration. They wanted British sovereignty. They are often identifying as English rather than British as well. And on the opposing side are identity uh, liberals. And we uh, in a book uh, try to say that very few people really investigate that group. This is the kind of group that is uh, thought to be and marked by nothing else apart from uh, those kind of avocado eating ways about, uh, you know, about them. uh, Fewer books are written, fewer articles. And I think this is reflected um, in the fact that we don't really know what their attitudes really are. We just know that they are more liberal than the identity conservative group. They are less threatened by the social changes. And in fact, they are beneficiaries of these social changes. So these are the well-educated people. 
uh, people who are very comfortable with diversity and in fact value diversity. They think ethnic change is a good thing uh, because it brings new cultures, new ways of life. And they have this idea of an open mind. They want to be open minded. They want to be welcoming to difference. Um, and this group is a, is a new group of voters in terms of history. However, it is a very fast growing group. So this is the group that is set to become a majority uh, of our voters um, very quickly. And one of the distinguishing features of our book, I think, is that we are trying to delve into them as well. So we are trying to study what attitudes do they have as well. So we're not just treating them as the, um, the opposite of identity conservatives. We are trying to find out what this group really values, what they think and what they like. And one of the uh, results of this uh, investigation is that we were able to uh, subdivide this group of identity liberals into conviction liberals and necessity liberals. Um, the conviction liberals are those white uh, educated uh, people who are also on average younger than identity conservatives. And they, as I said, believe in diversity as a great thing. They are predominantly focusing on living in cities um, and they, they live the lives of this globalized uh, new era uh, that is dawning on our societies. However, this group is in an electoral coalition with another group of liberals who we call necessity liberals. They are predominantly ethnic minority people who are on average much more religious uh, and therefore they have a lot of much more traditional views, especially on gender issues, uh, on sexuality and other issues that we would associate with the white, well-educated urban people um, to, to have as well. So they value, I think, diversity, but they would also value diversity in lifestyle choices. However, ethnic minorities wouldn't to the same extent, especially the older generations. So one of the reasons why they are liberals is because the most important argument that the liberals are having with the conservatives is about race and racial diversity, ethnic diversity, multiculturalism. How do we adapt to having become a very diverse society? And so one of the most important takeaways of the book, I think, is that this coalition is therefore not forever. It's a coalition of, um, of convenience for ethnic minority voters. So as long as our society is arguing about race and uh, equal rights for racial minorities, this would be a coalition. But of course, if we move on from there, they won't necessarily fall on the same side of the um, liberalism equation at all. And we've seen some hints of that even at an earlier stage, I guess, in society's development with, for example, you know, Donald Trump's relative success with non-white voters in the 2020 US presidential election. Um, and it's something that, you know, more traditional Republicans have at times managed before, that, uh, which Bush it would be George W. Bush, part of his initial political success in terms of being elected as a governor. And it's easy, it's easy to forget pre 9-11, you know, how Bush was touting a new form of sort of moderate, compassionate conservatism, that as with, you know, Trump in 2020, both of those were in part based on reaching out to ethnic minority voters in the US on a basis of shared cultural values and, and to try and break that very strong racial polarization in, in US politics. And I guess it's striking that if even Trump, with all of his policies and his rhetoric, was able to weaken that link between sort of identity and necessity liberals, it feels like that's a link that could be quite fragile in the face of a sort of politically popular <laughs> I nearly said astute, but let's leave to one side the debate about whether Trump is, is astute or not. But certainly, a, you know, a, a, a more successful Republican presidential candidate surely could make even more of that decoupling than even Trump managed. Absolutely. Um, and I think it is very important to remember that even when we think about the anti-racism um, debate itself, so leaving aside those issues of, of gender or family values or uh, sexuality and those kind of non-traditional lifestyles, even within that debate about racism itself, there is a huge division uh, between various ethnic minority generations, but also groups. 
um, and just simply different ethnic minority people might not agree on what is um, the right solution. And so we um, often as white people, we just assume that the most extreme anti-racist position would be the one that is the good one. Uh, however, this is very complicated and a lot of uh, ethnic minorities for example, in Britain, do not believe in institutional racism, as we know from some of the conservative black um, MPs comments uh, in the Commons uh, in 2020. Uh, not all ethnic minorities support Black Lives Matter. And in fact, a lot of them, I think, find um, the conviction liberals uh, a persuasion that they have to be increasingly more radical on the issues of race as in fact alienating. And some of them would uh, feel like they wanted to go into a more individualistic, more colorblind um, political options, like uh, for example, in this country, the conservatives in the, in the US, the Republicans. And, and I guess that's reflected as well in the evolving vocabulary. But I mean, there, there always is a range of views as to what's the appropriate terminology to use. But certainly my impression is there's a very, been a very clear move in Britain in recent years from using phrases like BAME, Black and Minority Ethnic, towards using phrases like ethnic minorities in the plural to emphasise the point that it's not a homogenous white and then non-white. Actually, there are lots of different, there are lots of different groups within the latter category and lumping them all together means you miss, you know, the variation in, in views, in interests, in priorities. You know, in the Lib Dems, that's particularly striking that we have a impressively diverse, albeit sadly small, parliamentary party uh, at the moment because majority female and two out of the eleven would you know be classified from ethnic minority backgrounds. But I think for most ethnic minority communities in Britain, it doesn't particularly feel like you know the Liberal Democrat parliamentary party has, as it were, one of their own in it. You know, and, and it really brings home that. That, 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 that it's multiple communities. I suspect, though, as neither of us being from one of those communities, we should maybe move on to an area more, as it were, sort of correct to the argument of the book, I think, in many ways, which is just the speed of change. And there were two things that really struck me from sort of early on in the book about how much the country has changed since the 1990s. One was that even at the time of Labour's election victory in 1997, twice as many people had no formal post-16 education qualifications than had a university degree or higher. So twice as many, nothing past 16. And now more people have a degree than no post-16. And that's in the population as a whole. So, you know, that's a huge, you know, huge change. Um, or, or, or also, I think one of the other shocking, really, statistics that, you know, you quote in the book is that as recently as 1993, over 40% of voters said they supported the idea of the government paying members of ethnic minorities to leave the UK. Mm. And that, yeah, that was in the 1990s. Um, I, I don't know what the current figure is, but that I think it's safe to say it would be massively less than 40%. Um, so in one sense, it, the, the picture your book paints is of a huge sort of liberalising shift in, in Britain since, well, over a consistent period of time, but it's a huge shift even since the 1990s. If you look at British politics, though, from, say, a Westminster perspective, and you look at the path of politics from the 1990s, it doesn't feel like that's how politics has played out, perhaps particularly in the, in the recent decade. So what's, what's your take on why there has been this big shift and yet it's not really played through into the Westminster politics story? So I actually disagree with this. I think there has been an enormous change in Westminster politics as well that maps on onto those big um, changes in society uh, to some extent, but also um, doesn't in ways that makes the, the, the kind of conflictual polarized uh, politics worse. So in terms of the way in which we have moved on in, in politics to reflect those changes is for example, we have now the most diverse parliament mm. uh, and, of course, the most diverse cabinet. So uh, the kind of advancement of diversity 
uh, has been enormous in our society. So we have gone from, uh, as you said, a society that was almost entirely white in the 1950s uh, to a society in which most people would have experienced a personal contact with an ethnic minority person. Uh, similarly, with education, we have gone through, uh, I think last year marks the, the first time ever in our history where more than 50% of 18 year olds have applied to go to university. Um, so these enormous changes have actually been reflected in politics and in very many ways, uh, apart from representation. And we know, of course, that the number of um, MPs without any university education has also shrunk very considerably in that same period. Um, but also in a kind of on the ground, in the kinds of things that our uh, political parties are talking about. And this is why, uh, on the one hand, the politics has moved on with the society, but of course societies, the way they change, uh, they don't change overnight. They change over decades. And the changes that we are experiencing are generational. So all this changing is really happening for young people. And the younger you are, the more different you are, uh, the, the, the more stark the contrast between your lived experience and the lived experience of your grandparents. So somebody who was born in the 1950s and is still alive and an active member of our electorate will feel that the politics has changed beyond recognition as well as society. Whereas I think from uh, somebody from a much younger generation and especially from that identity liberal group looks at politics and says what you just said, which is, politics has not changed. We are still, you know, arguing about racism and we have mm. cultural wars, etc. And I think that is an impression that we form because of our respective places in society more than actual reality. And I think this is a, a strong point that we're trying to make very strongly in the book, is that our entire society is becoming more liberal and we are all changing. Um, it's just because of this generational structure some people are traveling much faster in this direction than others. And we are no longer arguing about paying uh, ethnic minorities to go, uh, and these are air quotes here, it's uh, <laughs> important to underline, go home, um, because it's become so unacceptable, no pollster will even ask that question. So this is why we don't even know how many people might still hold this view. So even the people who are now being accused of um, holding racial, uh, racially conservative views or, or even straight up and down racist views will not ne be nearly as racist as somebody in the grandparent generation who was being accused of being racist. And I think that's something that you touch on a little bit in the book, which is very relevant to the continuing debates about you know, Britain's relationship with the European Union, for example is that there's a large chunk of society who feels it is more liberal, it might not use the word liberal, but feels it's more tolerant maybe than it's, you know, it's the previous generation was, but also then gets very defensive when attacked by succeeding generations for being, you know, bigoted or racist or whatever. And obviously there definitely are bigots and racists out there. Um, but there's a chunk of people who both feel that they're more tolerant than people used to be, and yet also being attacked for not being tolerant enough, and and politically have often reacted to that by by therefore rebuffing the calls to be more tolerant and almost dig in and 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 be more entrenched. Yes, and this is um uh, we talk about um this in terms of social norms in the book because we think this is the reason why people get so emotionally invested in being accused of being a racist. Because uh, in our society, the anti-racism norm is extremely widespread. Most people in, in fact, we present some, some data on this, the absolute majority of people uh, both think they are not racist, but also think being racist is a very bad thing. But we also show in a book that people vary in terms of where they think the line lies. So some people will um, uh, try to expand actively uh, the notion what is and isn't racist, whereas some people think, as you said, I am already not racist. I've already moved from where my grandparents were, from where my parents were. I am so much more tolerant and liberal. What are you doing me saying to me that I am being a racist? And 
because this argument is about social norms, it is very important to both sides that they are on the right side of the debate. Being accused of being a racist is um, is, is a kind of a almost slanderous thing to say to a person who doesn't feel it's a fair accusation. And of course, nobody uh, engages in this tone of debate on other political issues. So if you say, um, I disagree that the post office should be nationalized, you are not going to be accused of anything uh, like being a racist. You're not going to be told you are on the wrong side of the moral divide here. And other uh, kind of issues that we sometimes think of as also identity issues, like, for example, gender, also don't have this similar emotive uh, weight to them. So if you, for example, think that women should stay at home and look after the children, you are not going to be subject to such a scathing societal judgment as when you say that you think um, minority uh, ethnic people are lazier and that's why they earn less money. Uh, that latter statement will get quite a lot of social scorn. And so this is why the, um, the issues of ethnic diversity are particularly uh, kind of uh, hot coal quality to them. And this is why they underline those divides so strongly. Yeah, I, I suspect the former example that you mentioned would get a fair degree of criticism, particularly on social media. But I definitely take your point about there being something particularly divisive in that sense, where people react particularly strongly, where allegations of racism are involved. I remember, although it's a few years back now, when I was at university, um, there was one lecturer who was very bad at remembering people's names. And he went round a group of people in a seminar group at one point, at the beginning of one term, and he sort of, you know, asked each person their name and he would make it, he made a little joke, you know, like, oh, okay, you're what, James, you're wearing a striped jumper, always wear a striped jumper, you know, and so on. And so he took us. And there was one person who, I, in my memory, was the one non-white person in, in the group, who was uh, a woman from Kenya. And so she was the one, one non-white person. In the group. And when he came to her, he just immediately said, that, that's OK, I'll be able to remember your name. And people really polarised between on um, some people being absolutely horrified that this was just you know, picking someone out for their skin colour was racist and others thinking, but of course, you know, if you're trying to remember somebody's name, you know, you remember what's distinctive about, you know, I, in, in a sense, there is no real meeting of minds to be had on whether your instinctive reaction is that's appalling or no that is self-evidently sensible um, and and I think that I guess that's the other element of it it's not only is thankfully the idea of being racist held in such you know as such a negative thing that people are very angry often if they feel the label is being applied to them when it shouldn't be um, but also there are some aspects there which in a sense I mean you could debate and argue you know until the cows came home but are not, you know, are so much rooted in our gut judgments that there's not really a lot of scope for persuading people to change their views or or, or, or finding common ground, except you know, in in the longer term. You know, I I, I don't think uh, if you were to try out that example, you know, I gave on a group of people and you saw how they polarised their actions, I don't think there's any anything pretty much anyone in one group could say to persuade people in the other group even today. Mm. Absolutely. And I do think it's um, an interesting um, thing to think about, because I think also in you are describing uh, something that has happened in the past. And this lecturer didn't even think about it. Whereas now I think one mm. of the attitudinal changes is that I would have uh, wagered that he would have stopped himself and thought about it. Mm. And one of the attitudes that we do find amongst this group of conviction uh, identity liberals is that they have what we call a motivation to control prejudice. So it doesn't mean that they won't necessarily jump into similar kind of gut feelings about race and people who are of different skin color, different ethnic origin, but they will try to self-police those attitudes. And they are very sensitive to where the line lies and they will be much more responsive therefore to the perceived moving of the line into a more kind of expansive way in which more things are now racist than they used to be, than people who simply do not have that 
internal motivation to try to control their prejudice, they will probably not notice and they will begrudge the line moving quite strongly. And I think, I guess, one other aspect to this may may well be the overall state of the economy. So I think, you know, in, in your book, you sort of highlight how for those identity conservatives with more sort of authoritarian, less sort of liberal tolerant leanings that the more under threat they feel, you know, there's some evidence, isn't there, that the more under threat they feel, the more hostile they are to people who are in the sort of the out group who are not, you know, not like them. And the basic story of, you know, both this country's economy and many other economies since 2007 is one of a lot of economic pressure on a lot of people in their daily lives. And so um, I wonder to what extent, you know, that's a factor that, that, that may have accelerated some of those trends because the 1990s, broadly speaking, were relatively good economic times. There were definitely, you know, huge problems with poverty and so on, but overall, the economic outlook was improving. And, and then, you know, that carried on through the first part of this century, but came to a resounding halt in 2007. Mm. Yes, yeah, so this is a question which we don't really tackle head on in the book, because one of the reasons was that it simply was too much to talk about everything. Um, and we, we already have written a very lengthy book. Um, but the certainly we spend a lot of time talking about threat and how people find immigration in particular almost um, inevitably uh, threatening. We even use some examples where that immigration uh, did not come from abroad. So we, we use a, a 1930s example of a small town of Banbury, and we only talk about it because there's a very good book about it uh, by, by Margaret Stacey. Um, and the appearance of people who have different customs and they have different accents and they open their own shops has really appended the Banburian politics in a way that is very parallel to what has happened uh, to Britain in response to immigration, first from the um, uh, kind of countries of the Commonwealth, uh, previous colonies, but also in the early 2000s in response to the Polish and Czech and Slovak uh, migration. So there is something about immigration that isn't about economy so much that people who can be very economically secure and successful can also find influx of others uh, very threatening. But of course, I, I do believe that economy doesn't, um, the economic crisis doesn't help this problem. Um, and one of the reasons I think is because once we have that sense of threat, then others are threatening us. If we find new problems, if new problems arrive, we already have a, a ready-made other to blame for those problems. So if somebody already didn't like immigration from the new accession countries in Europe, the, the kind of uh, Central and Eastern European countries, the arrival of an economic crisis would have been a really good opportunity for them to say, well, this is why we have to now cut all those services because there's pressures from those places. So uh, an immigrant is always the kind of ready-made other to put all the blame for, for all the problems. Um, and of course, another issue that is hugely linked to economics and it was a great regret, in fact, uh, for Rob and I that we had no space to cover it, is that a lot of um, cities now and university towns, these are the kinds of places that hoover up all of our identity liberals, both ethnic minority, so the necessity liberals uh, predominantly uh, live in cities and congregate there, um, but also the young uh, conviction liberals, the more educated people leave wherever they were from, and they mass migrate to cities and other places that have universities and knowledge economy in them. And these kinds of places therefore have a completely different uh, profile, both sociologically, but also in terms of the economies. Uh, so they are growing, they are cosmopolitan, they are globalized, um, they are benefiting from all these processes of globalization. Whereas the people who don't uh, get educa university educated are therefore left in those places. A lot of those places are shrinking. They have the old style economies that are less uh, resilient and they are much more likely to therefore experience various economic shocks and crises um, as well. So there is a huge economic story that is linked to the geography of those social changes that we describe in the book. 
and, and I guess that helps explain, you know, that in, and I will try and define my terms more carefully this time round, remembering I'm, I'm speaking with an academic. If you look at, um, you know, the European referendum result, the 2019 election result, and indeed the path the Conservatives have taken with their last two leadership elections, those are not, that's not an obvious quartet of results that points towards a country with underlying, you know, movement towards liberalism. Um, and obviously part of what your book explains is how there is this people becoming more liberal at different speeds and the tension that, that, that comes from that, which can therefore help explain what we've seen in the last few years. But I guess the other element, which I think you touch on a little bit in the book, but maybe don't quite fully develop, is that because of this geographic impact, of the more liberal people in communities being the, those who are most likely to move, you know, mm. the more liberal people in rural and small towns and so on being those who are most likely to end up moving because they go to university, etc. Um, that presumably there's a fair chunk of the country where the overall pattern has been that those communities have not been getting more liberal because it's the communities around them that are getting more liberal. And, the, and, 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 and then in that sense, in terms of particularly a geographically based political system that's a very important caveat to the overall picture isn't it yes yeah, so i would still argue they are, are probably getting more liberal still because of simply a generational replacement mm. processes right so the people who were the least liberal are kind of slowly departing us and um the younger generations even if they don't live in a particularly uh, ethnically diverse area, they will still see a much more diverse Britain through the television, the, the kind of early education, the kinds of values that are being given are, are still much more liberal than the ones that the parents and grandparents would have been growing up with. But absolutely, as I said, we uh, see those two trends of education and diversity uh, absolutely concentrate in, in certain geographical areas. And as a result, we have this um, huge area where a lot of seats in terms of our constituencies are still very much uh, playing to the to the kind of old uh, rule books and they are not only uh, is it a, a, a kind of gives the a political party something to really have to think about because now they have to win those very different types of seats right they have to win those extremely globalized diverse uh, cosmopolitan seats with lots of educated people but they also have to uh, win those seats that have um, a lot of uh, identity conservatives uh, sh often shrinking and aging populations and uh, completely different economic troubles uh, but another thing that's happening is that political parties are getting fewer and fewer of the kinds of people who can represent the second type of area um, properly. So one of the things that we discuss in the book is that our MPs have become much more educated and much more liberal than the society at large. So if we are talking about the different speeds with which people liberalize, then our political elites are the speediest of all um, and even when we, so I was part of, of a team who uh, conducted um, big uh, surveys of political candidates. So these were people who were trying to get into Westminster and become MPs. And even when we looked at, at UKIP voters and compared them to the UKIP candidates, the UKIP candidates were much more liberal on all the things you can think of, diversity, immigration, than the UKIP voters were. And this is uh, hugely so much more the case for Conservatives, for Labour in particular, but even for the Lib Dems, that you would think, oh, the Lib Dems will get lots of Liberals voting for them. But actually, even those Liberal voters are not nearly as Liberal as the kind of candidates for Parliament. Um, and the, the example I always think is useful to bear in mind with that is the death penalty, because mm. I, I often find, and I'm sure there'll be amongst some you know, listeners who are listening to you just now, who were thinking of conservative MPs and thinking what 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 on earth is this argument that these people are more liberal there but the death penalty is a really good example that even you know even amongst the current conservative parliamentary party which in many ways is a fairly right-wing parliamentary party um you know the, the 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 level of support for reintroducing the death penalty is massively lower than it is amongst the population as a whole and 
you know, depending on how you phrase the question and perhaps also when you ask the question, such as do you ask it just after a horrific murder or not, you know, you can get quite high levels of support for reintroducing the death penalty from the public in opinion polls. But there's not been anything close to a parliamentary majority. Um, well, I would say probably since before I was born, yeah. <laughs> certainly for a very, you know, and so in that sense, there is a huge difference. And it's a difference even among, in, you can see even in the ranks of Conservative MPs. But, but I wonder also if, if there is a, a, a point here which is maybe clearer in US political geography and less so in UK political geography. That in the US, it's become almost received wisdom in the last few years that the basic political geography of the country benefits the Republicans over the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And that although the Democrats, for example, have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight US presidential elections, it's not a Democrat dominated country in the way that you might expect if that was the one voting figure you knew about. The US. And that's partly to do with the distribution of the you know republican democrat votes and where the political boundaries are drawn and how that therefore means you know the republicans can can win control of the senate with a minority of the votes and, and so on um, and in the uk i guess because we've had a bit more changing back and forth of government and so on um and also we've not had for quite a while now one party wins a majority of the votes another party wins a majority of the seats it's not been a salient an issue, but it sounds like from what you're saying that that's maybe an issue we're going to end up paying more attention to in the future. That this political geography of the yeah. huge concentration of the small L liberal vote in urban seats, which currently predominantly returns Labour MPs, although many of them in many seats in the past uh, would have been Lib Dem. Um, but you know that 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 potentially risks, from the Liberal perspective, a repeat of that US problem. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we do actually uh, look towards the US quite a few times in the book because it is um, US is almost always uh, like the UK uh, politics on steroids, right? So it's always more pronounced there. But we absolutely face this issue. We have, um, if the society is changing and it is changing quite fast, and there's a huge uh, kind of taking over of educated liberals, it won't matter in politics if they all start living. Uh, in the same places, because of course we know that um, that just leads to inefficient distribution of support. So uh, the Labour Party might already get uh, more than 50% of their votes from these Liberal voters, but they still need some other voters from elsewhere to vote for them. So there's no uh, huge benefit uh, to continual increase of their share of Liberals um, that live in cities, right, in terms of uh, new voters. They need to find the new voters elsewhere. And I suspect this will be a huge issue, um, especially if we think about the efforts to uh, push up those towns and cities and, and areas that don't have those globalized economies, aren't benefiting uh, from, from um, kind of influx of educated people and knowledge economy. If that doesn't change, it will be more and more pronounced. And there's all sorts of things that play into this, not only uh, inefficient distribution, but we also know the young people vote less. So even students who were supposed to be the, the big force behind the Corbyn revolution, at the end of the day, as always, and as ever, they didn't vote in enough numbers. Um, and this whole myth of youth quit did turn out to be this, right? It turned out to be a myth. Um, so, but I, I guess the picture for the Liberal Democrats specifically may may well be the almost the complete opposite of that. In that, while whilst the, that electoral geography is a problem for the Labour Party, in some ways it makes it easier for the Lib Dems to prosper in a first past the post Westminster electoral system. Because yeah. traditionally, the big problem for the Lib Dems and prior to that, the Alliance and the Liberal Party was having support that was relatively geographically evenly spread having a greater concentration of the voters the party can best appeal to in particular geographic areas is just what you want to prosper under first past the post and so it may be that uh that that helps the lib dems but if it does it will make that dilemma all the bigger for the labor party because then the labor party risks being caught between yeah. wanting to hold on to votes and seats against challenges from the likes of the lib dems and, you know, in, in Scotland as well, from the likes of the SNP. But on the other hand, worrying about 
uh, or worrying about whether it should worry about <laughs> trying to gain uh, votes and seats from the Tories in other parts of the country. Yes, and of course, winning new voters is one thing, but actually losing some of those um, identity liberals is also a risk that they cannot really take very uh, easily. And especially uh, when we looked at those new voters, those identity liberal voters who have um, flocked to Labour um, in the early 2000s, in the mid 2000s, rather, uh, what we dis did discover is that unlike the previous voters that Labour used to have, they don't really have a very strong loyalty to Labour. So they wouldn't, they have voted for Labour the last few times, but they wouldn't describe themselves as Labour partisans. So yes, absolutely, Lib Dems could give them a run for their money on those voters, but also um, other parties like the Greens, uh, who are increasingly uh, popular amongst the younger um, uh, con conviction. I think the competition for those voters in those globalized cities might well be um, something to consider as well. So Labour needs to somehow find a way to win back the the old voters without <laughs> losing the you know enough numbers of those new voters. And again, coming back, cycling back to this issue of MPs. I really think Labour cannot do it with the current uh, political elites uh, that they have. Those elites will not chime in with the identity conservative voters. They are too obviously uh, avocado eating identity liberals, highly educated, uh, with completely different views on way too many things from those voters to meaningfully represent them. Yeah. So just before we wrap up, a slightly cheeky question, because... I think a lot of what we've been just discussing in, in the last few minutes is essentially based on the assumption that the picture that you've painted of the trends shaping British politics, it, you know, th those trends will continue and that picture will be the picture that you know, determines the future of British politics, essentially. But there's quite a tradition of sort of popular expert best-selling books that set out a future for politics based on demographic and social trends that get their authors lots of attention and plaudits at the time. And then if you go back and read them 10 years on, mm. you realise politics wasn't anything like that. There's, there was a whole set of books like that in Britain in the 70s mm. about, you know, the decline of two party politics. Uh, there was the one. It's, it's a, still a really good book to read, but horrifically wrong <laughs> in the sense. Book in 1992 called Is Britain Turning Japanese? About how the Tories might, you know, carry on winning elections forever, and of course, actually, they're then lost by a landslide the next election, and indeed, lost the next three in total. There's, you know, as we've used the example of the US, there have you know been books like, you know, the New Democrat Majority, which you know never panned out, and so on. So, mm. slightly cheeky question: How confident or how scared are you that <laughs> the that your book isn't, in that sense, going to mm. suffer the same fate? That in ten years' time, it will be, oh yeah, you know, feel quite pleased that I, you know, wrote that book that. Lots of people really liked at the time, but you end up then with a decade's worth of work trying to explain how politics turned out differently. Well, uh, so this book really is oriented around trying to explain Brexit and what happened. Why did we end up with the referendum result we have and how it wasn't this huge electoral uh, shock on its own. It was really grounded in our history and in those bigger sociological and political changes. So when we do the part Brexit, we leave the referendum behind a little and think about the future, we do try to caveat ourselves a little bit um, in a way that hopefully will give the book a little bit of a longer shelf life. Uh, because we do say one of the biggest threats to uh, this narrative that we've just been uh, talking about, as in all of these uh, groups continuing and uh, you know, this politics being about identity, about who's liberal, who's not, etc. The biggest threat to this is, of course, that we will come back to politics as usual, which is about class and economy and about government competence and who is the more competent uh, governing party. And in fact, we think that's quite likely, um, uh, mostly because the British political party system has been built around that. Um, and even though we know from history of liberals, for example, that it can change and we can have those big upheavals of party system in this country, it is not the likeliest scenario. So, in fact, it could well be that 
COVID, uh, for example, will give us this kind of crisis of, you know, how did conservatives do in handling the pandemic? And after the dust settles, it turns out voters decide that Labour would have done better and it will all become about who will do best with NHS. So we're not really trying to say we will definitely continue down this path, but we are explaining um we think about 20 years of British politics uh, from about early 2000s to uh, the 2019 election in those terms. And we don't think uh, anyone else will look back in time and say, oh, Maria and Rob were entirely barking up the wrong tree there. But even if new trends come along, the trends will still explain what's happened in recent years. Uh, I've just taken a look. I won't quote the final sentence of the book, so no spoilers for readers who haven't haven't yet read it. But uh, but I, I did notice your final sentence uses the verb may rather than will or shall. So you you, you very wisely end on a slightly caveated note. <laughs> but finally, if anyone has found this discussion interesting or you know enjoys reading your book and would like to know more about these sorts of topics. Is there anything in particular you would recommend to listeners? So one of the uh, big things that plays an enormous part in our story, but we haven't actually had the time to really discuss, is this role of the British Empire. And so I have not, I can't say I've finished it, but I have started it. I'm very impressed with Empire Land uh, by Satnam Sangera. And I think if we need to understand our society the way it is now, we definitely need to start with the Empire and the immigration that came from it and the attitudes it's given us. And I think that's a very under under understood and under thought about um, uh, part of the story. Yeah, one thing I, which I, you know, learned completely afresh, you know, from, from re- reading your book was actually the importance of the concept of empire in setting the framework for immigration and citizenship policy in Britain in the 1940s after the Second World War and the huge legacy that that had. You know, one can only really explain what happened in the 60s and 50s based on the framework that was created in the 40s. And you can only understand that if you understand, you know, that sense of continuing sense of empire in Britain's ruling classes in, in the 40s. So, yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that book recommended. I've not yet read it myself, but I can heartily endorse at least the theory of saying that's a definitely one that people should read. So I will include links to that as well as, of course, Brexit land in the show notes. Um, but thank you very much for your time, Maria. It's been absolutely fascinating. Listeners can find Maria on Twitter at Prof Sobleska. So that's at P-R-O-F. S-O-B-O-L-E-W-S-K-A, myself at Mark Pack and this podcast at Bar Chart Podcast. And if you like listening, please do tell others about this podcast and give it a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. Thank you until next time.